All right, to get us going, we are going to call to the stage Bishop Grant Hagia from the Greater Northwest Episcopal Area and Mr. Lonnie D. Brooks, Chair of the Legislative Committee from the Association of Annual Conference Lay Leaders, and they're going to explore proposed changes for clergy and for bishops. Let's welcome them to the stage. It's been a joy to work with the Commission on the Ministry Study, and uh, this is my 12th year actually working with this group. And um, we have this joke that uh, the Ministry Study has been around for the United Methodist Church probably since Moses uh, created the stone, had the stone tablets delivered to him. Uh, there was only one quadrennium in the last, I think, 50 years that we didn't have a study of mission, uh, Commission of Ministry Study. It's great, been great to work with this group of dedicated and brilliant Christians, though, and we had a joyous time working together. Our central purpose, though, really was to provide pathways for the church. And unlike General Conference, where we don't get the chance to delve deeply into theological and ecclesial issues, we have the time to really reflect and to uh, dialogue with each other and even to spar with each other on differences of opinions about theological matters when it comes to ordination and all of the leadership pathways of our church. One of our um, highlights of this commission was that we had a Duke immersion where we brought together the scholars uh, from in United Methodist Studies uh, to give us presentations on their take and wonderful sense of dialogue with them. So, we really are providing the think tank for the United Methodist Church on matters of leadership and directions of ordination. Uh, we feel that uh, honesty is the best policy, and here are some of the principles that we had in front of us. We want to be completely transparent about these. Really, a commission doesn't do this work without um, in a vacuum. Each one of the members were seminary uh, professors or leaders, presidents, um, local church pastors, uh, boards of ordained ministry chairs. Uh, we had a multitude of folks who provided the glimpse of the reality of the church is facing. And we're hoping that this will reflect in um, the kind of recommendations that we have before you. The most important factor that we have to consider is leadership, leadership, leadership. We feel that that is the, one of the key ingredients in revitalization of our denomination and vitality of local settings. It's gonna come down to leadership. And this is a chance for us to take a look concentrated on your behalf and then to send it over to you for your consideration. Here's the specific proposals and again, I'm not gonna read these. Uh, good PowerPoint um, presentation. You're all bright enough to read it. I don't need to recite it. Uh, these are all in the final report, which we will have available online. And there's a website at the end of this presentation that we'll turn to, and you may digest this. I just wanna give you some highlights though. Um, it really is um, a sense of us delving deeply into the theology of ordination and looking at the biblical, historical, a theological, and um, um, ecclesial resources that we have available. And that's what we tried to do. We are trying to clarify our ordination and, uh, in terms of a theological position. And I'll share a little bit more specifically on one issue that's coming up uh, around that. We want complete flexibility our whole philosophy was we do not need to bring in a lot of legislation for you to chew on. We want to streamline legislation, in fact, to give maximum flexibility for annual conferences and boards of ordained ministry to move in a direction that is relevant to where they're at and their context. So we really want to see uh, less legislation and less rules about leadership and ordination. And we specifically are not going to bring in a lot of specific recommendations for you all to, to uh, vet, but to provide more openness in the whole process. We also have a growing collaboration with our seminaries, especially our 13 United Methodists and the myriad of other seminaries who are approved by University Senate. So again, we are reflecting our sense of openness to diversity and to meeting the needs of the local context. 
There were some issues, for example, let me give you one, one thing. We're finding that ethnic candidates who are in the course of study or who can't go the seminary route because of uh, jobs and uh, family need more flexibility. So we, one of the proposals that uh, working with uh, General Board of Higher Education Ministry is to allow a, a bachelor's degree to fulfill the requirements for course of study. So that means that a, uh, especially an ethnic candidate who needs a bachelor's degree to continue on in ordination can get the course of study under their belt when they graduate from an undergraduate institution. And we found, especially in the Florida area, this is a, a definite need. And Bishop Ken Carter um, really pushed the commission to be more flexible in its um, standards uh, for allowing new leadership to emerge. And that's one of the things that has come in before you all in legislative purpose. The other issue is the big one, and that is we're trying to reshape the ordination process. Now, some of us got tagged with this line of early ordination the last go-round. And to tell you the truth, it's not early ordination, it's ordination, period. We are just trying to be consistent in a theological vein. The, the word commissioning is, I think, kind of squishish. It's, it's <laughs> theologically, there hasn't been a kind of identification of commissioning to ordination. And we've made up this term as a kind of um, practical way to keep candidates uh, vetted in the process. But it confuses our ecumenical partners who do not understand what's the difference between commissioning and ordination. And it also says to our candidates, we heard, we did um, studies with them, that they are less than ordained, even though we give them full rights uh, within their um, uh, setting. So what we're proposing is theologically correct, that the entry point of the church is ordination. And what we're suggesting to the boards of ordain, ordained ministry is just back it up then and start your vetting process much earlier leading to this first step of ordination. We also are separating conference membership and that way you become a provisional, ordained provisional, provisionally, and then a minimum of two years before you can then apply for full membership into the life of the annual conference and really are guaranteed then uh, a setting. So it is really theologically correct for us to eliminate commissioning and go directly to ordination. And we really feel that this is the right thing to do. Now there's the practical element and that is the boards will have to readjust because of this. That's a reality. We realize that. But with some lead time, we think that this is feasible. I have a, a lifelong friend. Uh, in fact, it was the first wedding I ever did uh, almost 40 years ago. And um, my friend's philosophy of marriage goes this way. You can either be right or you can be happy in marriage. And he said... Sometimes you can't be both. And he says, I choose to be happy. <laughs> My retort with him was, well, what if you're neither? Then you're really in trouble. Um, but the, the point of this is, uh, we think that this is the right thing, but will it make the church happy? You all have to decide this. And it really is theologically correct, and it would help us with our ecumenical relations as well as our theology of ministry in a deeper sense. And the next stage of this is then to tackle the local pastors issue, which again confuses our ecumenical partners. You mean they're not ordained, but they have sacramental rights? We talked about that, but did not come to a conclusion because the practical reality, as you know, is we need local pastors, especially as the denomination shrinks, there are those settings that cannot afford a full elder. So the next commission will have to take up this issue of ordination with local pastors, and we've written that into the uh, study guide also. Finally, it is supporting the leadership in terms of the overall um, entire cadre of uh, options available. And we want to provide a sense of support and accountability to our current clergy. 
you all have friends, I do too, lawyers, doctors, they are required to take a continuing education that's prescribed in order to keep their license current. We all have that in our discipline, and yet, folks, it's not enforced at all. So what we're proposing is a way to provide some teeth into a lifelong learning process. That if you're like me, ministry uh, did not, or learning did not end at the end of seminary or graduate school. It continues every single day, and I'm of the opinion that I'm gonna die when I stop learning. Our clergy need this kind of grounding. And so what we're proposing is some ways in which uh, the entire clergy cadre can enter into accountability and lifelong practices of learning and new directions. Because in the world that we have now, they're going to have to adapt or we're all in trouble. That goes for everybody in the church. Uh, it's going to be a world in which complexity and ambiguity and um, all the issues that we're facing now in a worldwide connection are going to be full force, and our learning is critical to this. We're going to skip the questions to the end. This is the website that you can go to. Um, just go to uh, gbm.org, GC16, and the full report will be there. You can download that, um, chew on it, digest it, and then um, have it ready for your legislative processes. We want to um, have you consider deeply the things that we've reflected upon. But the issue is to provoke a conversation among the general church also. So we hope that you will um, have questions or have comments to us. And we're, we stand ready to um, sort of feel those and it's too late to change anything at this point, but we want the dialogue to continue. Here are the commission members, and it's a very diverse group, as you can see, but the other thing is that we are grateful for these folks of giving their time and energy to invest in this process of deep reflection and deep dialogue with each other. It was a joy to work with them all, and um, I want to thank them. I want to especially give a shout out to the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry who funded our, our initiative because we didn't have funding. And also, um, Meg Lassier, who is a staff person, uh, as well as many of the higher ed and Board of Disciples staff people helped us with the process. Uh, Meg provided, and Jasmine Smothers provided the presentation. You have the full uh, PowerPoint available for you. You can download that also. So your delegations can go through this in a more fine-toothed way, and we hope that it'll be helpful for you. Um, that's the end of um, a very short presentation. Uh, we hope that I'll be around, so stop me, stop any of the commission members that you see, and we hope and pray that uh, this will be points of reflection for you in many ways. Thank you. I'm Lonnie Brooks, the lay leader of the Alaska Conference, and I serve this quadrennium as the chair of the Legislative Committee of the Association of Annual Conference Lay Leaders. And I'm delighted to have this opportunity to tell you a little bit about some of the petitions that the association has submitted to General Conference 2016. Uh, first, I wanna tell you that we think that there is nothing in the church that is outside the area of responsibility of lay people. Since we are the folks who, by and large, are called on to pay for everything the church does. <laughs> so we've boldly stepped forward in a place where some folks think we don't belong to propose a fairly comprehensive package of proposals for reform of the episcopacy with a couple of proposals that will have significant impact on how the episcopacy relates to other elders as well. You can find the petition that forms the core of our proposal for reform of the episcopacy 
as petition number 60510 in the ADCA that has been posted. That's on page 1083. That's the Advanced Daily Christian Advocate. Since the highest level of interest in what we've proposed seems to focus on our proposal for Episcopal reform, that's what I'll concentrate on right now. We've got seven points of reform that we've offered, and I've summarized them on a couple of slides. We're proposing to change the Constitution to provide that election of all new bishops be for term rather than for life as now prevails in the jurisdictions. In addition, we're proposing that the term of elections be the same across the entire church, both in the jurisdictions and in the central conferences. If our proposal is adopted, the membership of all bishops upon retirement or expiration of term would revert to the annual conference. We also propose to eliminate any sense that there should be a limit of three quadrennia for a bishop to serve in one Episcopal area. And we propose to reform the Episcopal complaint process. We propose to eliminate conflicts of interest for those who serve on jurisdictional and central conference committees on Episcopacy. And finally, we propose to provide that the lay leader of the annual conference be afforded the opportunity to serve with the cabinet when it advises the bishop on appointments. For other elders, we propose to change the Constitution to eliminate the barriers identified in that document by the Judicial Council to the ending of guaranteed appointment. To give you a bit more detail on our package proposing reform of the Episcopacy, we believe that electing bishops for term rather than for life will, one, increase accountability in the office of bishop. Two, recognize the realities of career development patterns. Nobody in the secular world starts out any longer in a career path expecting to stay on it for life. This will allow for changes in circumstances both for the people who are elected and for the whole church. And election for term will allow for the correction of mistakes in a much less disruptive and traumatic manner. I want to emphasize that this part of our proposal is not retroactive. Bishops who have already been elected for life will continue to serve for life. Term elections would be in effect only for newly elected bishops upon the certification of the amendment to the Constitution. My second point here is just as important, and that is that all bishops across the whole church will be subject to the same provisions for election. And as you know, in some of our central conferences, term elections already are the rule. All bishops in the jurisdictions and in the central conferences, if our petition becomes the law of the church, will have the same terms. We see this as a matter of equity and fairness. 
Similarly, when any bishop in the whole church either retires in office or has his or her term as bishop expire, then his or her membership will revert to the annual conference. This part of our proposal would be retroactive in the sense that it would apply to all bishops, whether they are elected after this um, goes into effect or not. It's important to note that this feature is something that our bishops who are active have been asking for. In fact, uh, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, know that the council is already excluding retired bishops from one of its meetings each year, although it calls that meeting not a meeting for some reason. I should point out to you that these proposals, when they were at issue at the meeting of the Association of Annual Conference Lay Leaders, were supported by a vote of 29 to 7, which is an overwhelming level of support for such a significant proposal for change. In fact, there really wasn't any debate uh, in the association's meeting about whether or not elections should be for term, but over whether the term of election should be for eight years with a possibility of one re-election for an additional eight, or for a term of 12 years with no possibility of re-election. Our proposal, uh, as it is before you, would be for the former, which is to say an eight-year term of election with a possibility of one re-election. We think that each jurisdiction and central conference should have authority to decide for itself how long a bishop can effectively serve one Episcopal term, or one Episcopal area, excuse me. Finally, to some degree in cooperation with a couple of other United Methodist bodies, uh, General Counsel and Finance Administration and the General Board of Higher Education in particular, we are proposing to change the process that will be followed when a bishop is subject to a complaint. Currently, the, respond, the respondent bishop's college has full and final authority over the complaint process. We are proposing that if the college is unable to process the complaint to completion within 180 days, either through referral for a judicial process or an administrative process or dismissal of the complaint, then the complaint will move to the full Council of Bishops. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to make this a presentation of our legislation. I hope you'll read through it. And I look forward to your questions and to our continued conversation as we go forward to General Conference 2016. Family, we have time for one or two questions, and I'm going to ask that if you have a question that you line up at the mic and just remind us of our family covenant as we gather uh, to keep your questions to about one minute, and we're going to start practicing for general conference and uh, possibly cut the microphone if it goes beyond that. But uh, identify yourself, please, the name, uh, annual conference, publication, affiliation. We'll start over here. Thank you. Thank you, David Bard, Minnesota. Lonnie, I'd be uh, interested in hearing more about the conflict of interest portion of uh, your, your legislation. You didn't elaborate on that, and I'm not really clear what that involves, and I'd like to hear a little bit more about that if you wouldn't mind elaborating. Don't mind a bit, uh, David. In fact, I, I thank you for the question. Uh, 
it's been observed that in some uh, instances, uh, persons who report directly to a bishop uh, in their work responsibilities are serving on our uh, jurisdictional uh, committees on episcopacy. I'm not sure what prevails in the central conferences. I suspect there are some there as well, but I don't know that for sure. Uh, the, the Association of Annual Conference lay leaders thinks that's an irresolvable conflict of interest for those people who are in such service uh, because the primary uh, point of evaluation of a bishop and feedback to the bishop on his or her performance uh, is in that committee. And so uh, we are proposing that people who are in a direct reporting relationship to the bishop uh, be barred from service on these committees. That does not include uh, uh, clergy who are serving in local churches or in campus ministries or uh, other uh, settings in which they don't report directly to the bishop, although all clergy, of course, in one sense or another, have a responsibility to the bishop. But uh, in most instances, in those settings that I've named, uh, they are not uh, directly reporting to the bishop on a day-to-day -day basis. We'll take another question. Bill, <clears throat> Bill Shillity from New York. Uh, question for both the commission and for Lonnie, our bishop and Lonnie. Uh, why did the commission not uh, choose to do any work on the security of appointment, and why did the lay leaders decide to try to uh, improve the legislation from the last time? Good question. We uh, did deal with it early on, whether we should pick it up or not. Uh, we checked with our chief counsel for the Council of Bishops, Bill Waddell, who really felt um, it was moot after the ruling. So we didn't, he felt that um, without removing some of the barriers that Lonnie had talked about, it wouldn't have gone anywhere. And so that's the reason we choose not to bring it up again. I think our general feeling was we are in support of that uh, as a group because half of the members or one third of the members from the last commission were on this one. Um, but we did not know that uh, lay leaders were going to take it up and we're glad that they did. Marty, did you want to say anything? Our approach was not to propose legislation uh, to, uh, to end guaranteed appointment. That is not what our legislation does. What our legislation does is, as I, as I said, removes the constitutional barriers that were identified by the Judicial Council so that if uh, the, this change in the Constitution is approved, then a future commission or an individual or whoever might, in fact, petition a future general conference to uh, take the action to end guaranteed appointment. We're just paving the way so that if that is uh, the will of the church, it can happen. Let's show our gratitude and love to Bishop and Lonnie for the work that has been done. Thank you. That was easy.